Well, hello everyone. I'm pleased to see such a large turnout for this great event. We're here to celebrate uh, Mickey's work here, uh, Dr. Mickey Corso, as the case is, for this uh, particular MA Thesis Theater. Uh, the title for today's talk is The Lady and Our Lady, Galadriel as a Reflection of Mary. And uh, it's basically a good chance to kind of think about Jarrah Tolkien and the Catholic, Roman Catholic context of his work, something that uh, certainly has academic interest and also has a lot of personal interest for folks, as you can see by, by the turnout. Um, Signum University's MA program has uh, quite a number of courses and topical approaches to things, but then we have our students really kind of dig down and find their way to the point of, of doing an original piece of research that engages in the scholarly conversation and does some deep reading, close reading of texts, and then produces something that uh, could be published as a journal article or move on to something in, in some other context for teaching and writing. And so I just want to give just a, a brief bio of uh, for, for Mickey, and then and then I'm going to hand things over to him to give a bit of a presentation, just to talk for a bit about the things that that he's discovered, and then we're going to open it up. So most of the session will be your questions and your comments, and uh, we'll use the hand raising thing. I'll, I'll explain that when we get there. So Michael J. Corso, PhD, we call him Mickey here, is a lifelong Tolkien fan who is excited to have earned a degree now from Signum. He has a doctorate in theology and education from Boston College and is currently the chair of the theology department at Catholic Memorial School in Boston where he regularly brings up Tolkien to his students. Mickey, as he is known to friends and family, is married to Catherine, his wife of 35 years, and has two daughters, Rebecca and Elise, who are themselves enthusiasts of all things Middle Earth. I'm waiting for one of our student bios to have like, you know, names like Galadriel, you know, <laughs> you know as, the, as the children, but, 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 but the, the, the love of the thing can work just fine. So, so, so Mickey, why don't you take a few minutes, to just kind of explain some of the things that you've been exploring and uh, folks, uh, I'll, I'll disappear just for a little bit and pop back up uh, when it's time to do a discussion. And you can go ahead as, as you're going along, you can put questions in the little question box there. I'll do my best to curate them and uh, when we get to that point. Uh, so you, okay. Can you see my screen correctly? Yeah, okay. it looks great. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, first of all. Um, and thanks to those of you who are here. Uh, I don't know who's out there, friends and family. I can't, can't tell another Tolkien fans and scholars. I appreciate you being here. Um, so uh, my topic for my thesis, uh, being myself a Roman Catholic, so uh, full disclosure, uh, and knowing that Tolkien was a, a devout Catholic, um, as I made my way through Signum courses, I became increasingly interested in the influence of Tolkien's Catholicism on his writing and his creativity. So um, I wound up going down this road. I, I myself do not have a, a particularly strong devotion to Mary. I'm a fan of the woman who raised Jesus of Nazareth. Um, but certainly uh, it seems Tolkien was more than that uh, as I began to dig in and examine some of his biography and some of his writing. So uh, the, the whole project began with uh, two claims Tolkien makes, uh, more than two, uh, I'll focus on just two. Uh, one of the more famous claims Tolkien made in letters, uh, letter 142 to a Catholic priest who was a friend of his, a Jesuit priest, um, who had read some draft manuscripts. He wrote back to uh, Father Murray saying, the Lord of the Rings is of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, uh, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. In that same letter, he also makes some comments about the relationship between Galadriel and Mary. Uh, but for that, I went to another letter, uh, letter 320, um, which was, I believe, to a woman named uh, Mary Austin, I'm blanking on her first name right now, but Mrs. Austin also wrote, uh, noticing, uh, bringing up to Tolkien the uh, relationship that she saw between Galadriel and Mary, and he wrote back saying, I think it is true that I owe much of this character to Christian and Catholic teaching and imagination about Mary. So Tolkien made these claims um, here and elsewhere. And so my basic question is what, what's the evidence for that? Uh, other scholars, other Tolkien uh, secondary literature uh, notices Tolkien's claims and themselves, those authors themselves make 
um, reference to, oh, sure, you're sure uh, Galadriel and Mary, uh, there's a relationship there. But I didn't find a lot of evidence, a lot of um, sort of laying out the case that this was the that this was so, simply that Tolkien claimed it and other people noticed it as well. So I set out to sort of prove, um, prove the case. And there are three uh, lines of argument that the thesis goes down. The first is to set Tolkien's claims uh, and the character of Galadriel in the context of Roman Catholicism, uh, which is bigger than England. It's a universal religion, a global religion at least, not the whole universe. Um, and I hadn't found that. I hadn't found a, a setting of the claim in the specific context of the Roman Catholic Church, particularly from 1850 to 1962. There's a unique period of the Catholic Church in England at that time, beginning with the restoration of the hierarchy. Um, so for many years, uh, England was mission territory for uh, the Catholic Church uh, because of its uh, split from Henry VIII's uh, efforts to get an, an enrollment. Um, and then we know, it, it, those are sort of Catholic at least, know in 1962 the churches begins a new sort of period of culture um, and theology. So that particular period as a context for Tolkien's writing, I hadn't found a lot of um, scholarship on that. Um, the rift in Roman, in English, Catholic, English Roman Catholicism goes back again to 1534 and the Act of Supremacy and, and Henry VIII's decision to break away from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but the immediate context is that from 1850 to 1962. Um, that placed an emphasis within Roman Catholicism in England on things that were distinctively Catholic. So as Catholics um, set themselves apart from their, um, from their Anglican and Protestant uh, fellow Christians, there, there, there was an emphasis over that period of time on things like the Blessed Sacrament, which is unique to Roman Catholicism. Uh, at least claiming that, that that's really transubstantially the body and blood of Christ. Marian devotion is distinctly Catholic, distinct from Protestant Catholicism. And so those uh, emphases that were unique to Catholicism uh, have an impact, have a profound impact on the English church as it finds itself under siege and wanting to set itself apart from um, other Christians in England that were not specifically Catholic. So that's my... Um, Nikki, my sorry. sorry. Sorry to interrupt, Nikki. Just a, a tech thing. Your your um your PowerPoint screen's a little bigger than what's showing on GoToWebinar. In the um in the uh, uh the show screen, did you select the um is it a second screen that you selected, yeah. or did you select the program itself? I select the program. I selected the screen. Should I do the program? Yeah, try try the program. See if that helps. It's we're able to get most of the stuff, but um. How's that? Is that looking a little better now? Oh, that's um no go uh I'm, I'm zooming in and out it's a prezi actually it's not a powerpoint so. oh i see yeah yeah so okay so that shows everything oh okay. yeah no that's perfect then that that makes sense that it's not giving us necessarily the whole thing so right yeah. so, sorry to interrupt um yeah no that's i think that'll be fine as long as we're getting the main details the pictures and the and the words that you're focusing on so okay. sorry Kurt. Carry, carry on, Vatican II on its way. Yeah. Great, yeah. So, um, so the, the second line of argument then is sort of having established the, the broad context of English Roman Catholicism in that period of time, I wanted to pay sp sp particular attention to devotion to Mary during that time period as one of the distinctive elements. And so things like the rosary, um, the doctrine of the uh, assumption of Mary into heaven is actually uh, promulgated by the Pope in, in uh, 1950, so during Tolkien's lifetime. Um, people wore things like scapula, which have a whole uh, a whole veneration, a whole adoration, a whole um, devotion associated with them. And then there were many, many prayers that Catholics of this period said to Mary. Um, the Hail Mary, the, uh, the Litany of Laredo, um, these were features of other practices, sometimes tacked on to the end of a benediction. Uh, but there are many, many prayers to Mary. In fact, without giving too much away, Tolkien actually translated some of those Marian prayers into his invented language of Konya. Um, and so here we see, um, uh, you know, classic Tolkien uh, drafting, rewriting. Here we see the, uh, the Hail Mary, which is known in Latin as the Ave Maria, uh, the Subtuum Presidium, which is under thy protection, and then the Litany of Laredo, which he never finished. It's very long. 
Um, and so here we see translations, like uh, you can see it there, Ai Maria, which is Hail Mary. Uh, and he translated at that time anyway, grace, full of grace as the sweetness of Eru. Um, to thy patronage we fly. And this is a prayer specifically asking for Mary's protection from harm. And then in the litany of Laredo, which begins, Lord have mercy, but goes on to a litany of prayers to Mary that he uh, that he abandoned, uh, completing the translation of. So we're going to look at a second and something I call reciprocal applicability. So here we see in Tolkien's devotional life, the devotion to Mary and that he focuses on these Marian prayers and then applies them to his uh, language, his, his invented language. Um, and then at the top and the bottom are two versions of the Alpha. Um, so that's the second context. So the first context, the broad context, the second context, Marian devotion. Of course, that includes paying attention to particular practices within England. So we know Tolkien grew up in the Birmingham Oratory and um, there are many images uh, to Mary in the Birmingham Oratory. Uh, Cardinal Newman who founded the Oratory, a big influence on the orations there, was himself uh, writing a lot about Mary uh, and engaged in Marian devotion. And then of course in Oxford, a couple churches that we know Tolkien shows up in, uh, from his biography and letters, St. Gregory's um, and St. Aloysius Gonzaga, which is in Oxford just down the street from the bird and baby. Um, I, I've been to both places. So uh, the third thing then to do was to look at the, specifically the character of Galadriel and to do a close reading of Galadriel from her appearance in Tolkien's imagination as laid out by Christopher Tolkien in Unfinished Tales right up to her publication in The Lord of the Rings. And then through her numerous revisions as Tolkien started to build a backstory for her into the Silmarillion. Um, that history of Galadriel from her first appearance in Lothlorien to, through The Lord of the Rings into the Silmarillion leads Tol uh, Christopher Tolkien to write, there is no part of the history of Middle Earth more full of problems than the story of Galadriel. Um, so good job. If you pick in the most complicated thing to study. Uh, Tolkien writes uh, in relationship to another character, Sam Gamgee, that Sam Gamgee was a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and the Batman I knew during the 1914 war and recognized as far superior to myself. So Tolkien himself makes claims about Sam Gamgee and his relationship, his reflexive relationship to guys he actually knew in the trenches. In, um, in the second, the, the forward to the second edition, he writes, I cordially dislike allegory and it's all, all its manifestations. So we can be sure that Galadriel is not an allegory. Uh, and always have done so since I grew old and very enough to detect this press. I much prefer history, truer fame, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of leaders. So applicability and reflection were sort of ideas that I found a way to um, name the relationship that I saw in Tolkien between Galadriel and uh, his devotion to Mary. So reflection or reciprocal applicability. Out of his experience of those Batman, he creates Sam Gamgee. And then if you know Sam Gamgee, maybe you know the Batman better for knowing Sam. Um, Eucharist, people have said, um, and there's good evidence for this, uh, is a reflection uh, and it applies uh, to Lembas. And then if you know Lembas, you know maybe more about the strength and the effect of Eucharist in your spiritual life. And it, out of the character Mary, so claims Tolkien, um, he built the character Galadriel. And if you know Galadriel, perhaps you know uh, Mary better for knowing Galadriel. So that's what I mean by reciprocal applicability. Tolkien never uses that, that term specifically, reciprocal applicability uh, or reflection. Um, there's no greater monument to this uh, principle operative in Tolkien's life, I think, than his gravestone, um, on which he he decided to write uh, Luthien on the tomb when uh, his wife passed away, and then asked his uh, children to add Baron uh, under his name. Reciprocal applicability between primary world and secondary world. Um, and so that's the thesis uh, rolls out along those three lines. Uh, it establishes the context of uh, English Catholicism in the early 20th century. It investigates Tolkien's Catholicism, specifically his Marian devotion and his preference for performing his theology rather than simply um, expounding his theology. He wasn't a preacher, he wasn't a theologian, but he certainly performed in his characters and in his story elements that we find in Catholicism. 
And then finally, a close reading of the text as it applies to Galadriel um, from when she first appears to the dramatic scene where she turns down the ring into the gifts uh, that she gives to the uh, fellowship in various forms, probably the most important of which is the file of Galadriel with a light in it. Mary's obviously most important role for all people of faith, I believe, is that she um, gave the world uh, Jesus, who John in his gospel claims is the light of the world. And, um, and then I go into other perceptions of the lady. Some people are very suspicious of Galadriel. Some people believe uh, Catholics are very superstitious when it comes to Mary. Uh, her journey into the West at the end uh, with the rest of the um, ring bearers. And then a little bit on the revisions Tolkien did as he backstory her into the, as he read Contra into the uh, Silmarillion material, which starts to create all the complications that Christopher refers to. So that's the, uh, the main thrust of my, uh, my argument and it's um, three pieces. Okay, excellent. I actually have, uh, just to give a peek behind the veil, I have a series of kind of hard thought out questions to go through and, and Mickey has kind of answered all my questions yeah. with with a very brief, no, it's good, with a very brief conversation. And I actually quite like the Prezi um, and you didn't kind of make me dizzy as it can sometimes happen, you know, with Prezi's. I mean, like, I think, I think there, let's 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 instead of just doing questions, let's kind of highlight a couple of the things that are sort of striking about this, Mickey. I mean, like, no prayers, no temples, no religion, which is unusual in fantasy literature. Often those things, and sci-fi, often those things are kind of looped in. Certainly in historical romances, we would see them. It lacks the religious themes like epics, Dante's epic, Milton's epic, uh, and it lacks like kind of the up on the top symbolism of the text, like certainly Fantasties, which is is certainly uh, something Tolkien read, Narnia, um, or, or even like some of the people that follow after the Fianavar tapestry has the, the the weaver as the providential kind of character or his dark materials, uh, which that's mm -hmm. a little more complex. So, but it's still there, right, at the surface. Yeah. So if we don't go back to the Silmarillion, I mean, it would be pretty hard to talk about the Lord of the Rings and, you know, even understanding gods and creation. So, so like, what would you say to somebody who just says, well, I, I appreciate that he wrote that to a priest, but come on, I mean, like, look at the text. Yeah, uh, I mean, so first I would say it's on purpose. So good job, Tolkien. <laughs> I would say <laughs> he purposely took it out um, and he's good. So that's why it's hard to detect. Um, so it's the intention of the author to have removed the churches. And we know from, I think, the Kenya lexicon that there are words in Kenyan for, uh, that were originally planned, I guess, for inclusion, uh, for church, for Jesus. Um, I forget all of them, but uh, there are specifically primary world terminology, specifically religious terminology that show up. Um, and that are abandoned. So whatever his process was for, for purposely, I think he says in another letter, um, it's absorbed in the work for absorbing it. That's why you can't detect it. Um, the, the best analogy I can think of is, um, look, if you were to look at a sponge um, and it would say, well, that's a sponge. And then when I squeezed it, all of a sudden you would go, oh, that's what's in the sponge. Um, you know, maybe there's milk in there, maybe there's you know, lemonade in there. But whatever in the sponge, you can't figure it out. Uh, until you squeeze it. So the scholarship is the squeezing um, and the searching for evidence is then looking at what has squeezed out of the sponge into the, into the bowl. So that's, I think that's why it's not obvious. Tolkien purposely took it out. And that I think I, I wrote in the thesis uh, and you commented on this, Brenton, that um, maybe you have to set a Catholic to catch a Catholic. So Catholics <laughs> like Father Murray or Miss, Mrs. Austin or like Ricky Corso and others, I'm certainly not you know, in this, sniff it out. They go, oh, that, that kind of reminds me of this. Lumbass reminds me of this. So um, I, I don't think it's entirely undetectable. It's just your palate, um, your nose has to be tuned to that flavor in the book. Uh, mm. and, then, and then someone has to come along, and I'm, so I'm not the only person who's done this, and dig away a little bit to reveal the evidence. And that I, th I think that's what I thought was missing, the evidence that this claim is accurate and not just something told and said to a priest friend. Like when you say you thought that was missing, you mean like in the scholarship? Yeah, I didn't yeah. think, I, I found like 
Stratford Caldecott. There's there's numerous authors who have written on Tolkien's Catholicism, and many of them, most of those who are Catholic, say, yeah, yeah, Galadriel married something, some version of that. But no one made the case, at least not I, not that I found. No one set out the argument um, and said, well, when Mary rejects the ring, I'm sorry. When, for instance, when Galadriel uh, rejects the ring, a case could be made there that that's the inverse of Mary accepting God's will in her life. Uh, and to lay out a cl in a close reading of the text, the way those two things kind of line up, or or the file of Galadriel and the way that gift shows up at critical moments in the narrative. Um, and then fails, I think one of the interesting things is that it fails at the end of the narrative for, I think, deliberate theological reasons. Or to look at, let's say, Wormtongue or, you know, think of uh, Saruman's suspicion of Galadriel mm. and line that up with specific biographical data in Tolkien's um, letters or in people who knew him who said, uh, yeah, he thought people in England were still sort of anti-Catholic. Yeah. Uh, and, and therefore perhaps suspicious of devotional practices like um, uh, adoration, uh, adoration of a devotion to Mary or um, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. So and I think when you line things up, I think you see the connections. And it, like, it seems to me though, like, you, you, I mean, I, I don't like what you, you gave kind of a soft suggestion that there was some anti-Catholicism in England. I, I think that's a stunning, sociological understatement, you know, and uh, English Catholicism, of course, is its own thing, right? There's a, it has a, a different flavor than, you know, in your United States or my Canada or, you know, on continental Europe or the Southern, etc. cetera. So, um, but I don't, I don't, I didn't get the sense from your work that this was a kind of a cloaking, like, under oppression or anxiety about uh, the outside world. No, no. Yeah, what do you think, either the literary or religious or both, what do you think of the value of this? Um, Cloaking is probably not the uh, right word. It's just one that pops into my head as I imagine, you know, a hobbit scurry yeah. across the countryside. I, yeah. If I hear your use of that word, I don't think he took it out on purpose to avoid anti Catholics, you know, an anti Catholic um, critique. Um, although I, I have seen that <laughs> actually, mm -hmm. um, but no, it was, some, it was something else. It was it was wanting to. I mean, I think he just loves the genre for one thing, um, and wanted to write in this genre and not write in specifically um, Christian modes or Christian ideas. So that that's one thing. Um, I forget where I read in the biographical information that the TCBY. Um, they set themselves a goal of transforming the world through literature and art. I, I forget specifically where they, they say they want to do that. It was called the Council of London or something like that when they were just, mm. just at the edge of the war. I learned that in John, Gar John Garth's class. Yeah. And then two of them died. And I, I don't wonder, and I, there, I don't have as much evidence for this as I have for um, the Mary stuff, but, but Tolkien felt like the weight of this promise was on him. And there is a way in which the Lord of the Rings um, in Tolkien's literature have had a profound impact on people's lives in a way that lifts them up, that provide courage. Um, that I think there's something cultural he set out to do that he knew he couldn't do if it was obviously a Catholic group. Hmm. So yeah. that, you know, take it away, well, yeah, or even obvious or even more generally Christian. Um you know like I, I like you you would have a much more i think people who respond to the lord of the rings in a spiritual or kind of intimate way i think that response is more diverse yeah. in that spiritual or psychological intimacy than most books that i've read so like narnia has a narrower religious response than yeah. i think the lord of the rings so it certainly ha i mean think i mean think about the hobbit lives you know, Frodo lives yeah. phenomenon, right? Yeah. Like, which, you know, uh, you know, with all these kind of neo pagan and cultural spiritualities and all this kind of stuff, uh, right, right out there, like just right out in front, and and I think very meaningfully for many people. Um, it's a much broader impact under under the cloak. 
this yeah, way. yeah, yeah. And I, I, I hope I hope everybody recognizes me. I don't mean cloak in yeah. any sort of negative way, just yeah. a, a simple simple kind of way of doing things. Good. So I might I might ask another question or, or two here, and then I'll have a couple more a little later on. But I do want to invite the audience in to, to, to this conversation. Questions have come into the question box. And, uh, and I'm going. I'm game to kind of uh, read those. Uh, or, but if you wanted to raise your hand, we will attempt to have you kind of share your voice. I do know that uh, if you can't see a red microphone that's been muted, then then you won't be able to. You just don't have the tech capability. But most people do. And if you want to say your question, uh, say a little hello to Mickey, and then uh, say what you want to say. Feel free to do that simply by raising your hand. But I do. I'm go I am going to turn a little bit to these. Uh, to these questions um, that we've got. And as you know, that Tolkien readers are very perceptive <laughs> readers, um, linguistically sometimes exacting. You actually spent quite a, a good chunk of your time, not so much in this last draft, working through etymologies and word meanings and things like that as well. Is that is that a fair fair comment? I did, yeah. So, I mean, and it obviously, I don't know what happened by PowerPoint, crazy like that. But, um, at an obvious level, the, the name Galadriel itself, um, mm. Roland with flowers, um, you know, so here's Mary covered in flowers all the time. Um, mm. it, it's interesting. Um, so like one obvious thing related, but not specifically Mary Lembas, we know is, uh, means way bread in Elvish. And that's exactly what the Latin word viaticum means. And Tolkien again says as much in a letter when someone notices the connection. Um, so I did do some digging into that, in particular, um, the, uh, the Hail Mary. Uh, I wrote a paper for a language class, an Elvish language class, where I unpacked that Hail Mary translation. And there's an interesting point where Tolkien changes the, uh, the, the Elvish word for grace um, from Eru Listen, the one I showed you, to Eru Ano, which means the... Uh, the gift of Eru rather than the sweetness of Eru. And if you look at those two words, just to pick on this particular thing, the sweetness of Eru is a really good translation for grace in the devotional context of Marian uh, practice at the time, because there's lots of prayers that talk about Mary's sweetness. Um, and so that's a good, that's a good Quenian word for that. But then he changes it. Why does he change it if that's perfectly good? Um, well, he goes for anno uh, in, for a lot of reasons. One, because it's also the Elvish word for gift, gift, but it's also the Elvish word for life. So he gets bang for his buck in saying that Mary is full of the intensified, the double ends in there indicate the intensified life and gift of Eru, who is God. Um, and she's full of that in a way that a pregnant woman is quite literally full of life. But Mary's full of the fullness of life because Jesus is the life of the world. So, so I did some digging into his his language that way to sort of mm. make that part of the case. Yeah, and that gift part works with your or maybe it reflexively right. works with your analysis, where in this in this particular paper you focused in on a number of the gifts of Galadriel yeah. in, in a fairly. Uh, yeah, so here, you know, these various different kinds of gifts, you know, Lembus and, and the cloaks and everything else. Yeah, well done. Good stuff. All right. Well, let's let's turn a little bit to the question, you know, uh, and comments. You know, Jennifer says that you know, I've also thought Lembus is a type of manna also, uh, and it's called the, the bread of heaven. Uh, as well as the uh, as the Eucharist, right? So yeah, so there's I think a a connection yeah. there. Yeah, I suppose the is man. I, I I suppose the image behind both too, right? Um, yeah. I think yeah. if you avoid allegory, you, you're open. You open yourself to reciprocal applicability. Like what does what does this apply yeah. to for you? It applies yeah. to you. It applies to man. Yeah, good. So in this case, allegory, and of course, Tolkien did write allegory uh, <laughs> for all for all to stay. Yeah. But uh, in his rejection, if we if we agree with him and set allegory aside as a category, then we have all kinds of levels of symbolic meaning that we can talk about, and we're not pressured into those boxes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not you're not you don't end up saying you know, Lempus is the Eucharist. Yeah. You end up saying something more like it is Eucharistic or something like that. Is that? Yeah, it is, too much? it is applicable. I, I want to stay close to Tolkien. It is applicable. It is a reflection, which in the thesis I talk about that word and the way it 
it implies a bending, a twisting. Um, I think there's there's an alloy nature of what he does. Uh, so other authors rejecting the Marian connection see a connection with Alicia, Alicia from She, from Not. Um, and other characters, pagan Celtic goddesses, and that's fine. Uh, I think what Tolkien did was he took a main chunk of mineral ore, they, let's call that Mary, and then he alloyed it with some other things and made Galadriel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then that word reflection is is a way of of speaking about symbolism in a non-allegorical way, and it's actually Tolkien's own word, is it yeah. right? Yeah. It is. And leaves yeah. it, he says out later in that quote, I think, leaves it up, maybe it's that quote, the freedom of the reader. What, what, mm -hmm. he, what he disliked about allegory, even if he did it, yeah. uh, is that it, if the writer is forcing Aslan, you know, it's hard to see Aslan as any other character. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, growing up, famously misread every allegory I was ever assigned. So <laughs> I, I, st I still take the reader's privilege. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even in this sort of situation all right should. yeah there you go okay uh carl uh carl hosseter of course uh, uh signamite he has a, a question if i can figure out yeah there we go if you um yeah there we go i think uh, yeah carl you you be self-muted but uh you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question at this point okay can you hear me perfect excellent thank you Carl. yeah so, hi, Mickey. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I, too, am a Roman Catholic, and um, I'm intensely interested in just the sort of topic that you're talking about, where um, uh, looking at this famous statement of, by Tolkien about being fundamentally Catholic. Um, so, in connection with that, you know, I've actually long held the conviction that the key word there is fundamental. Um, that what he means by that is that on in its foundations, mm -hmm. uh, really his entire legendarium is fundamentally Catholic. Mm -hmm. And some years ago, I took an interest in Aquinas and started reading up on his um, what could be termed his metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the more I read, the more I I could see that reflected in in Tolkien's writings. Um, and I saw I was wondering. Um, uh, a few years ago, uh, a guy named Jonathan McIntosh published a book called The Flame Imperishable, where he makes, he lays this out very plainly, the sort of Thomistic fun foundations of Tolkien's uh, metaphysics and cosmogony. And I wonder if you're familiar with it. If you're not, I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, I think he, he I, I am familiar with this it. case. It was one of my primary texts uh, for this investigation. Um, you'll notice there in the, uh, Thomistic theology. Uh, it was one, one page, but yeah. I can have a chuckle about why that is. Um, so yes, I am familiar with that, and there is uh, good evidence. I think that Tolkien was familiar, certainly laid out by Mackinac, that uh, that Tolkien was very familiar with um, the Thomistic theology. Of course, that's another feature of Roman Catholicism of that period. Neo scholasticism, the turn back to Thomas, uh, Pope's were in favor of right. And then Alice, um, and I was looking at my bibliography, uh, there's another author that makes uh, similar claims um, and, and specifically relates Thomistic theology to, uh, to Galadriel. So, uh, Alison Milbank? Alison yeah. Milbank. So both of those books were important to my thesis. Uh, Good. Yes. So, Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, and Carl, maybe we could. I know you have a couple other comments, and and of course, Carl is one of the Tolkien linguists that exists, um, an important global linguist, and so uh, I think you'll enjoy. I think you'd enjoy the the extended annotated version of Mickey's thesis <laughs> yeah. too, just from that. Very much so. Very much so. <laughs> perspective. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I was actually one of the editors of those uh, Catholic prayers. That yes, uh, yes, that's, among, that's cool. among which are the Hail Mary and. They have this other Marian prayers. Yeah. So, yes. Hey, 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 there we go. It's good to see yeah. people paying attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I actually, I, I met you, Carl, once at a, a MythCon and just sat down and asked what you did. And 
comments in this <laughs> way. I'm like, oh, it's like one of the first people I met at the conference. I'm like, oh, this is going to be intense. <laughs> I am, I am really sorry, but I can't remember what your name is. I'm terrible with names. No, I'm oh, Brenton. Yeah, sorry. I, and I, actually, that's, okay. that's I'm, I'm Brenton Dickinson, and and uh, I. Oh, okay. <laughs> apparently, my name's Sigma Host, and I, I didn't tell anybody up at the top of the hour. I I teach um, a bit in Tolkien or in uh, Lewis and everybody else. Lewis and Tolkien, and everybody else at Sigma. Um, including uh, one of the classes coming up this fall so yeah so anyway it's a uh, um, uh, anyway just kind of a funny story so now we have uh, a couple let's let's go to a couple of comments that are here and uh, forgive me just the, the awkwardness of this Laura puts um, Laura writes dr. Mickey your thesis sounds great my question uh, near the end of his life Tolkien tried to rewrite the carry of character of Galadriel from one that uh, had joined Feanor's rebellion out of ambition. She wanted her own kingdom some, uh, to someone who opposed him from the very beginning. So do you think he wanted to make Galadriel more like the Mary figure, like to align that? And this is, I guess, what Christopher Tolkien meant by one of the more beleaguered uh, figures in, in, uh, in, the, in the legendarium. So why don't you speak to that? Yeah, so... I think the arc, just to do it briefly, because it's, it is pretty complicated. The arc of what happens is, I think, she shows up in his imagination. So he, Lothlorien comes up as a respite spot, and he starts to write about Lothlorien, and there's no lady, there's no Galadriel, there's a lord. I, I'm guessing he thought that was a little too close to Rivendell. That's that's just totally my speculation. And so he wants an Elvish queen instead of a, another um, Elrond character. And we get Galadriel, and then as he starts to shape Galadriel, we see this marrying influence. Um, then after it's out, the Lord of the Rings is out, and he wants to retcon uh, Galadriel back into those stories. I, I forget what, where else he says this. It grew in the telling. <laughs> like all of a sudden, she's tangled up with Fionnir and the rebellion, and she wants the little lands of her own. And uh, you know, she rejects the, the Valar offer, uh, you know, an opportunity to come back, and she says, "No, I'm, I'm too prideful." For she doesn't say it that way, but. She's too proud to do that. In fact, uh, I'm playing a little fast and loose. In that letter to, in that letter 320 to uh, Miss Austin, he says, the, now this is, you have to remember, this is before, before certainly the summer only wasn't even published in his lifetime. So no one knows what he's doing there, revising uh, the Silmarillion with Galadriel in it. But he does say to her in that letter, by the way, Galadriel's not all she's cracked up to be <laughs> morally. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he doesn't say it that way. Uh, she was part of the rebellion. She uh, so, oh, that's news. That would be news to anyone who had read The Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, so I, I think he does start to retcon her and give her this more complicated backstory. But then at the very, very end of his life, we're talking within months of his passing, uh, he starts to pull her back from that rebellion. He actually, there's a couple of places where he says, you know, now that I think about it, Galadriel was really misunderstood by the, the rebellion and would have come back. And I, I forget exactly how he pulls it. But the arc is from nobody to Galadriel of Lord of the Rings to a very complicated uh, character that's prideful and would be hard to recognize as Mary, but then back to the, the original inspiration of Mary, where he tries to absolve her of any wrongdoing um, as it relates to the War of the Jewels. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, and I I think um, it's unfinished, right? Like that's it's the unfinished. nature. He yeah. never settled, really. I mean, that's what makes it so complicated for Christopher. He has to publish. He wants to publish so many. He has to publish a version of Galadriel, and so he publishes the the best version available from what he's got. Yeah. Uh, he says that at one point. That I had to I had to make a call. I couldn't I couldn't present a character based on proposed revisions. Um, yeah. I have it with actual material. Although the the Middle Earth history does then give us much more, um, yeah. you know, you know the layers that we're looking for. Footnotes on footnotes on footnotes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that which is the best, uh, which of course is the richness that we get. But as scholars or as people who feel like we have to kind of land on something, it does make it a bit more complex. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, and and for me, Galadriel really, as a as a reader, a relatively innocent reader to these texts, younger, and then as a young adult, and then in the last, uh, you know, I don't know, as an old adult now, I guess, I, yeah. I I'm always struck like Galadriel's such a 
I don't know if powerful is the right figure. Like, if you were to say, like, if you just read The Lord of the Rings and you ask, so who's the most powerful figure in the text? Um, maybe it's Sauron, but I mean, he's self defeat. Uh, to me, Gladriel would be other, you know, that figure, right? That I ascendant. Think that's figure. right because she keeps Sauron at bay. Yeah. Like, stronger. But she, there, there's a scene in the garden specifically where she says, I know what's in your mind also, that's in my mind, I forget the exact quote, and I am in a constant, again, paraphrasing battle that I'm winning, by the way. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, one of the retcons, so one of the, one of the claims is that, well, she didn't, she rejected the, she rejected the, uh, the forgiveness of the Valar. And mm -hmm. actually what Tolkien says is, no, she didn't. She felt it was her duty to stay in Middle Earth until Sauron was defeated. And because of her power, uh, and her ability to protect. And yeah. so she was not unable to go back, she was unwilling to go back because she felt she had a duty still in Middle Earth. Yeah, and it's, and it's intriguing, you know, Elrond is more protective of his people, uh, you know, so distance, Sauron disappears into the power, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, the kings of men wait uh, until that generation to to rise up. So it's it's really a, uh, um, you know, and then, of course, these these gifts that, that you've worked through some of the symbolic layering of them and the images of them, they end up being, you know, these tiny transformational elements that have this huge effect on on, you know, basically the adventure that's before them, yeah. the rebellion. Yeah, yeah, no, it's intriguing, intriguing. So, uh, folks, I'm gonna go, go to a couple more questions. If you have a question that you'd like to speak out loud, just raise your hand, and and we'll we'll get to it. And I'm I'm and also you can put your question here in the in the notes. Okay. So, just a note from, uh, sorry, I'm having my the screens for the questions are a little, a little difficult. Uh, so there's a a distinction by Robert. So Gladriel seems Marian, but she's also not. Mary, yeah. and and which is I think what you're you know basically the reflection thing, yeah. you know Robert wants to use the word typology, um and and you and I talked about that at some point in the process you know so prototype type prototype antitype but like is that was that helpful to you because or or how did you feel about that particular approach? Yeah, I mean that works too. Uh, again, I don't think we need one critical tool to try and figure this complicated thing out. Um, typology, and, and I do spend a, a paragraph, I think, using, you know, looking at that idea. Um, there, are, there are parts where it is, I would say, typological, like, for example, maybe the way I treat um, Galadier's refusal and Mary's fiat is more closer to a typology, an anti-typology. Hmm. Um, I just found Tolkien's own language more, um, well, I guess maybe more, more safe from a scholarly point of view. Tolkien yeah. specifically says, Sam Gamgee's in reflection, and he specifically says, I have no doubt, again paraphrasing, that my work is applicable to the primary world. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if Tolkien ever said somewhere, there's a lot of typology in my work, or, but that, that's, that's kind of why I went for language that was uh, in Tolkien's mouth uh, rather than simply critical language like like critical in the sense of uh, literary critique by like typology but it's yeah. typology it would apply in some places as well yeah and I mean this is one of the intriguing features of studying the inklings particularly Lewis and Tolkien is that you you have scholars as writers, writers as scholars, and so you often have theoretical lenses that you can use that come out of the author's own work. Yeah. In this case, it's a particularly resonant um, feature, right? So, um, yeah, that works out well. Okay, I've got a comment here from Paul. You know, I appreciate your analysis of the implicit Catholicism in Lord of the Rings, like a sponge, right? Um, versus the explicitness, perhaps, of other fantasy writings. Isn't Tolkien's register, in this sense, eminently Catholic? So I, you understand, I think he's pressing in that this is a Catholic way of doing things, perhaps, meaning his narrative is developed, which places the personal histories of the character firmly at the center, while perhaps inviting them to see it in the light of revelation and tradition and to make meaning from it. In this way, it is um, it is a Mayu, 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 at, Mayutic, I don't know how to pronounce that word. So it's he just means like, midwifery uh the greek word midwife um yeah. 
uh, you know, echoing S Socrates and, and Plato, aiding the disclosure of something already embedded in experience but hidden. Yeah. Also, in a performative way, perhaps the narrative wasn't so cloaked to give him devotions. Okay, so I don't know if if that if you want to speak to that, um, cer certainly the midwife metaphor, but also like some is there something essentially Catholic about the particular approach? Um, I would say two things. One, I want to go back to what Carl said about being foundational. I like that idea that there's a foundation, then he builds stuff on top of that. But he goes on to say, talking goes on to say that it is absorbed. That's that's, that's what gave me the sponge metaphor. Mm -hmm. So. It's not, it's not only that there's a Catholic foundation that the rest of it is built on. Um, the, the materials themselves are rife with Catholicism and so eminently, to use Paul's language, eminently Catholic. You can see in many places, if you squeeze um, those elements. And I think if I could characterize the Catholic worldview as essentially a sacramental worldview, that behind this created world there is grace, there is God's presence, there is God's love, and that if you were to squeeze a tree, you would find God's grace and God's love, and if you were to squeeze a tiger, you know, you see where I'm going with this, that the whole world, said Gerard Manley Hopkins, is charged with the grandeur of God. Yeah. And so what Tolkien did, I think, if I hear Paul's question right, is he, he, him, he himself built the universe that was charged, I'm making this up as I go, with, with the grandeur of Tolkien. And for Tolkien, that grandeur was Catholic. And so lurking behind, not every word, but, but many of the, of the ideas, the themes, the characters, the plot devices, lurking behind it all was a Catholic idea. And maybe the most fundamental of which, which will be a chapter maybe in the book, if I get that far, is is the relationship between providence and grace. I mean, if there, if, between providence and free will, grace and free will. If there's anything eminently Catholic about the entire story, it's the way Eru operates in the story and no one would ever notice uh, that. And, and in fact, what he's asked at one point, uh, what it's about, what the whole thing's about, and he says, well, of course it's about God's, uh, God's freedom in, in the world. and, and God's providence, I forget exactly how he says it. So that moment when the file of Galadriel fails in, uh, is precisely, I believe, so that Eru's grandeur is revealed in the way the whole thing has come together to destroy it. Yeah, that's intriguing. Yeah, I, I've been, as, as somebody who works in theology and literature, I'm always trying to think about like what, what that, that phrase means essentially Catholic or essentially Christian or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins is just always such a tempting figure because yeah. he he tells the truth but tells it slant to steal Emily Dickinson there. And and of course there's a there's a Birmingham connection, Birmingham Catholic connection with uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins and Tolkien, although a, a different generation. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, that's that's good. And, I, and I'll note just a couple of things, and I, I wish I had caught this one, um, this comment uh, on the typology thing where um, Carl, you know, um, wants to respond and says that, you know, Lembus is a type of Eucharist in the way that Isaac is a type of Christ, yes. you know, um, you know, so there's a there's a sometimes a reverse order of the way we expect things to roll out. But that that same kind of um, that echo that exists there, if I can use that phrase. And uh, also wanted to say that, um, you know, Patricia asks, you know, can we have the, the books um, that you mentioned here? And so maybe before we close at the top of the hour, if, 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 if you could just mention maybe three or four places where people can turn, um, and, but also to note that, that Mickey's thesis will be published in the Signum uh, library, uh, and and if you if you reach out, usually our authors are willing to share <clears throat> for people that 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 need that kind of scholarship thing there. So, well, let's have we have uh, Dr. Sarah Sarah Brown. Uh, Sarah's a uh, Professor Brown's a uh, Tolkienist, uh, somebody who who works in this area. Uh, is the second reader of this particular project. Did, did you, Sarah? Do you want to pop on and 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 say hello? And I don't know if you have a, a question or a comment, or if you're going to sure. turn everything upside down. Yeah. Hey, Sarah. Hello. Hey, Mickey. 
Wonderful to see you. And um, can I just say what a privilege it was to be second reader on this thesis? Because one, I know how much work went into this thesis. Um, and secondly, it was just a delight to read. It was beautifully written. It was very well researched and it was a really great study of something that I know a lot of people will find great connection with, if you'll pardon the pun on connections. Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry about that, couldn't resist. Um, but one thing I would like to address is the thesis process itself, because mm -hmm. I know you had to go through the painful process of killing your darlings at one point. <laughs> yeah, see that look on Mickey's face? Yeah, um, because, uh, well, Mickey's work was incredible and comprehensive and wonderful and half the size it really ought to have been because it could have been double. And I wondered if you would just like to take the opportunity to share with us any of the many points that unfortunately had to get cut that you thought were actually this is something that was really dear to your heart and was a painful darling to kill. Uh, yeah, you know, they fall into two categories. Um, the first category would be sort of stuff I had to drop out of, stuff, uh, um, arguments I had to drop out of the beginning that was sort of a pre-defense of any, uh, not attack, but any, any critique of going, even going down this road. Um, you know, no less an authority than Michael Drought um, has raised serious concerns about any attempt to go down the, you know, there's, there's lots of concerns about going down the biography road and the psychologizing road. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I said a few things about that. But Drought raised a serious concern about going down that road, especially where it concerns areas of religion. Um, and I put up what I thought was a pretty good defense of that. Uh, and, and the importance of looking at someone's devotional practice as part of their biography, even if to other people, that's a bunch of whatever you want to call it, let's put the worst spin on it, superstition and nonsense. Um, so I had to cut that. I mean, that was pages long, that defense. And that, mm -hmm. I felt like I had made a really good case uh, in response to that uh, argument. And then, you know, each of these gifts, uh, so I think they're still up there, uh, were separate, right? Cloaks, I did a whole thing on the cloaks and a whole thing on the sheath and a whole thing on the bow and particular places where Legolas uses the bow, the bow that I think make the connection and prove the reflection. Um, there were lots and lots of practices in, you know, so Mary shows up a lot in the 20th century. I mean, like literally shows up. Um, uh, there's appearances of Mary, you know, there's Lords, there's Fatima, there's all kinds of stuff that happens that were part of the argument. Um, and although dribs and drabs of that make their way into what wound up to be the very cut version, uh, there were fuller arguments there that I felt uh, had to be made that I had to just make a statement instead of making a complete case. That, mm -hmm. oh, notice that the first person to be healed at Fatima was a woman with a right arm. And, oh, look, uh, that's the first person that Aragorn heals uh, under the banner of being Elstone, which is a gift that Galadriel gave him. And he heals, go figure, the right arm of a woman. So, again, there's not, I'm not trying to say that's an allegory of what happened at Fatima. I'm just saying that this is in the milieu of Tolkien's uh, faith life um, mm -hmm. and shaping things. Not entirely. So anyway, there, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were things like that that I felt I wanted to say that appropriately uh, were not said in this thesis. So, um, of course, this could turn into a second PhD. <laughs> My wife, who I believe is on this, <laughs> will not have that. Will kill you? <laughs> yes, I think that would be, yes. She's not um, on the way. She might be um, on our way now, so. <laughs> I mean, Sarah, I, I think, like, I don't know how we can kind of say that delicately, but part of what some were striking against with the Tolkien and religion perspective was sort of bad scholarship, like soft scholarship that takes place, right? You know, there's a kind yes, of a- that's unfortunate. Yeah, devotional, um, you know, the way it gets looped into fan fiction and things like that. And so um, without, actually, I'm not 
really trying to negate responses except to say that um, it's it's actually careful scholarship like this that um, <laughs> including darlings <laughs> left on the floor I guess careful scholarship uh, and that really is what's needed rather than um, you know uh, you know highlighting or negating an entire path if that makes sense is that, right. is that a fair comment yeah I would say that is a fair comment actually because um, I think it is unfortunate that some of the poorer, weaker scholarship has, some of it has been uh, in um, taking a religious optic to yeah. Tolkien's work. Um, and I can understand why people have done that. Um, but I think that there's there's been too many who have then said, this is the only way in which to read Tolkien. This is it. And they haven't really backed up what they're saying with good, thoughtful, in-depth scholarship. Um, and it's made me very wary of these kinds of, of readings, yeah. uh, which is why when I get one that is careful, thoughtful, considered scholarship, then I'm delighted because yeah. I think it's good to have many different perspectives. Um, and as you say, not to invalidate one completely or to only validate one completely, um, but to allow for the fact that one of the wonderful things about Tolkien and one of the reasons why we are still reading him, and I truly believe we'll still read him decades past my death, will is because he speaks to so many people in so many different ways, legitimately for every person in their own way. And I think that's one of the, the great things about his writing. So to come back to, to Mickey's work, um, I think that this is a, a really good example of how to approach Tolkien through the Catholic optic, but without just saying he's Catholic, it's Catholic, that's it, no arguments, yeah, um, right. which is something I've had yelled at me on Twitter far too often. Oh, yes. No, I 100% agree with everything there, and nothing you need me to agree with you, but um, I've read a lot of the, the literature, obviously, for this, uh, and, and, mm -hmm. the classes, and it is not great. It's, you know, it is a lot of it um, overly relying on just piety instead of scholarship, if I could put it that way. Mm -hmm. And um, there, that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to jump in with a thesis like this, was to say, no, we can do better. I, like I. Yeah, it's there. He said it's there. Other people have said it's there, but we can do better by way of producing the evidence. Um, yeah. So that's why I want that. Actually. It's more convincing yeah. when you yeah. produce actual right. evidence through actual yeah. scholarship. Absolutely. Exactly. And, and good reading. And Tolkien readers are good readers. And I think that's why there can be a distaste for certain things. Although hagiography is one of the accepted historical responses to figures. In this case, what we're trying to do is, is something different, like evidence-based, well-argued research that contributes to the community and then throws it out and allows the community to to, to come and, and offer their critiques. Mm -hmm. And actually, mm -hmm. you got a, a sorry, you got an amen is uh, how I'm translating it here in, in the questions for for your comment on Tolkien and, and religion. And then, but but also, and it was Paul that said it. But one of Paul's comments, one of yours, Mickey, was that it lee and and then what Sarah just said was it really leaves room for the reader. Still, there's a lot mm -hmm. of room for mm -hmm. for readers to live in these texts, which I, I think is 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 beautiful. So, but before we lose Dr. Brown, who, who's the the chair, uh, our chair of language and literature at, at Signum University, the second reader here, uh, her, a scholar in her own right, and also a teacher of one of the courses, Mickey, why don't you just briefly share kind of where this where this I don't know if Sarah knows this exactly, but where this thesis got going for you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say it's two places, one of which was Sarah's class, Professor Brown's class, in which you, that class was the context, Tolkien's context. Um, and we had looked at you know, post-war e economics, immigration. I, I think that class is still available at Sydney, which I would highly recommend. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, women's issues that were rife at the time. You know, we, there was a lot we had discussed about uh, Tolkien's context, that's the name of the class, I think, uh, and its influence on the writing. And um, there was some mention, I think, of his, his faith and his Catholicism, but I wanted to do more on that. So that's, mm -hmm. that sort of was the initial spark was, oh, if, if it's okay to talk about this stuff, let's talk about it. And so I kind of started to go down that road a little bit. The other, the other one was John Garth's class, which is also just mm -hmm. 
amazing class. Um, and so when I, when I looked at what his argument was, and maybe this is where the impetus to do this, the combination of your class and his class to do the serious scholarship, it's one thing to say, Tolkien's experience of World War I influenced his writing. It's another thing to, to lay out the case. Uh, now I'm not claiming to be in the same category as Dr. Professor Clark, but uh, he certainly lays out the case in the mm -hmm. evidence that there's a, an impact of World War I on Tolkien's writing. And so mm -hmm. I was trying to you know, light the LITE version of that, um, at least in this thesis, and sort of make the case. So in, in a sense, with your class as the umbrella and, and Garth's uh, contribution as a particular context, World War I, I was trying to do something with the religious context uh, as it related it to Mary. Yeah. Well, I'm absolutely delighted and flattered and many things great about the fact that it was like a springboard for you, that's my course. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. So I'm glad it was. Um, because yes, my, my course, although it was highly contextual, because it was responding to all of the angst of the 20th century, yes. didn't really touch on his faith as yeah. such. So this is, this is a gap that's being plugged and it, it's good to have that. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful, excellent, yeah, and I and I will I will know. Anyway, thank you, thank you, Dr. Brown, yeah, Professor Brown, for that's popping great. in. That's great. great. Yeah, my pleasure, really, my pleasure, and congratulations, Vicky. This is very well deserved for you. Appreciate it. Awesome, yeah, and and I will note too that we have um, we mentioned Dr. or we've mentioned Dr. Brown's work. We have that class, the Tokens Context one, is available for purchase as a Signum. Uh, anytime audit, I, I believe, and then it, hopefully it'll come up within uh, in a couple of years again for a, in kind of an in class class. But we also have John Garth's class, the worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, which is the yeah. first time being offered based upon his book, which I can't lift up because it's my microphone sitting on top of it. It'll make a big noise. Uh, I'll do that when, when Mickey's uh, listing his things. If, if you note this one, I'll, I'll hold it up at that point. And as well as some others, you can always check out. Uh, we typically have a Tolkien class every every semester, um, and uh, including, uh, I think, in the spring is uh, uh, Vern Flieger's uh, Tolkien and Tradition and, and and so on. Poetry will come up. The Lewis and Tolkien class was this past winter. So so uh, if you are interested, make sure you reach out to us to connect to those things. And uh, um, and I'm just real pleased uh, to have said, uh, I think, all the questions that we've got there. Thank you to everybody. Uh, Mickey, do you want to just list a, cu a couple of, of those or a handful of those resources that you think are really helpful? Yeah, so so uh, John McIntosh, John, Jonathan McIntosh is the Flame Imperishable, Tolkien, St. Thomas, and the Metaphysics of Theory. That that was important. That's one comment. Uh, Allison Milbank, Chester, Chesterton, and Tolkien as theologians, um, fant the fantasy of the real. Um, that was another one. I did a, a is that anything all right? I did a fair bit of reading just in English Roman Catholic history that had nothing to do with Tolkien, mm. uh, and those were those were decent books. Uh, they were they were interesting. Some of them um, a little bit uh, technical from a historical point of view, but they were they were interesting in helping me set the context. Stratford Caldecott um, has a lot of writing uh, on Tolkien and Catholicism. He's got a few books: The Power of the Ring, The Spiritual Vision Behind the Lord of the Rings. Uh, he has a book. Uh, called A Hidden Presence, The Catholic Imagination of J.R.R. Tolkien, which he uh, is one of the editors of, but is a contributor to as well. So if you were to look for Caldecott, um, that'd be another uh, set of books. Uh, he's got a few of them. A anything by Vern Verlin Flieger, uh, you know, digs into some of the philosophy, if not the theology of Tolkien. Um, Something like that. Joseph yeah. Pierce is another one who writes, uh, frequently on uh, Tolkien's Catholicism, P-E-A-R-C-E, -E, Joseph Pierce. Uh, and then there are, there are numerous essays, there are numerous articles that show up in other works um, where someone's you know, making the case in yeah. one way or another that Tolkien's Catholicism. And here's, and here's this, John yeah, Garth book, which I just had here, but it, it's also a wide book because it's full of pictures. And uh, and so I can use it to extend my mic out past my desk. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's it's what we call a a good book, a useful 
<laughs> useful book. All right. Okay. Well, just as we uh, close off here, Mickey, well, where does this go? Are you going to publish an article? Do, what, do you, what do you have in your imagination for your Tolkien studies? I mean, I, I would like to get to the book. You know, I think there's more. I think this is a long chapter in, 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 in the book on Tolkien's Catholicism. Not that there's a need for another book on Tolkien's Catholicism, as, as we just saw, but I do think there is a book um, along the lines of what Professor Brown was saying that really makes the case in a little bit uh, more careful way. Um, and I think that that the research I've done into the context as a, as a fan of Tolkien and someone who's engaged in writing about Tolkien and reading about Tolkien, what I maybe have at this point that I'm not sure everybody who's writing about that has is have, having read five or six books and did a really deep dive on Roman Catholicism in the early 20th century England, it completely independent of anything having to do with Tolkien. Uh, and so to be able to connect the dots between benediction uh, mm -hmm. and something Tolkien wrote or, uh, you know, Eucharistic devotion. Uh, there's a great letter where Tolkien says he has a vision during adoration of the cross and sacrament yeah. uh, of his guardian angel. So what's that all about? What are guardian angels in that context of early 20th century Catholicism? I actually so think, I think, I think you say a long, one. yeah, you say a long chapter, but I think you have the background, which would be its own chapter, and then Galadriel's gifts, but in, and maybe even the image of Galadriel are two chapters. And then as I think you actually have in the structure of this sort of the roughing out of four or five, not just one long yeah. chapter, just because of, of the various, like even just sacramentality might be its own kind of conversation um, and, and, and give readers a framework because, you know, most of like, you know the catholic world for those who aren't roman catholic is in a certain sense inaccessible because unless you've experienced you know experienced the eucharist you you don't know it right like there's a certain kind of sense it's like motherhood you know or you know or a bereavement there are certain things that are inside things and that you can, yeah like being in a trench of world war one yeah I, yeah yeah that's right yeah at this conversation and i i want to bring this up maybe it's 20th century pre-Vatican Council English Roman Catholicism that I would say is even inaccessible to a Roman Catholic in the 20th, 21st century post-Vatican Council. So my, even my Roman brand of Roman Catholicism, American post-Council, has Mary in it. Yeah. But I don't say the rosary. And maybe there are Catholics out there who do. I, I, I haven't been to a benediction or a, an adoration. Not recently, anyway. And Tolkien seems to have done that as a regular practice. So there were pious practices that were part of the world of that version of Catholicism that are, for most Catholics, not all, lost. Uh, mm. And that's what I try to recover because it's that Catholicism that Tolkien was writing, not this one. Yeah, that's a it's an entry it's it's an important for those when you get to finally read this in the in the paper or the book, it is an important distinction that's made. Um and, and you might even argue that Tolkien's actually even part of a, a relatively kind of specific re renewal kind of space of Catholicism, English Catholicism in that pre Vatican II space. And so there could even be a bit more work there um that 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 can do that um yeah and and uh so i think i think we're going to close off you know there's a question here by kate you know how much uh newman do you go into in this draft there's not not as much uh, yeah. yeah but Another of course baby. in the in the process of your writing you know newman went from the you know blessing <laughs> cardinal newman to say yeah. so, so there's actually a, a process going on living outside in the world and, and uh yeah. You know, and, and 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 someone here writes. You know, there are American Catholics who who say the rosary every there are, day. I know, sure, sure, there are, and yeah. I have. Yeah, um, and just it's not it's not as widespread, and it's not yeah. as it's not as high an expectation for a Catholic to engage in that practice. I think yeah. as it was for Tolkien in his time. Yeah, you were well, a bad Catholic if you didn't go to benediction on a Sunday night. Uh, I, I think I think you would you would say you were you were not doing what you were supposed to be doing. Yeah, and I, I don't think that's the case. Well, this is it. And so we actually see when we study context and text together, we discover that there is sort of two fields of vision 
that are in some way in relationship to one another, which is what, what you argued is your kind of structure. And I think we'll see this anytime, but this is certainly an imagistic one. It's certainly got a kind of a, a color and frame and spiritual energy to it that's worthwhile. So I would encourage people to follow up on this. I think I'm just going to, at this time, say, uh, yes, yes, Kate, we'll, we'll get this up in the in the Signum library as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as Mickey is able to uh, give us a, a final PDF We'll get that up there, and of course, this video, uh, provided the tech work, will be be available in the library and on the Signum University page. I do want the congratulations are starting to come here in the comments. People are reading me right. I am closing this off, <laughs> and and so before I I do the final thanks, I do I do want to note that with Signum University, we have a great MA program. Reach out to us. Uh, you you would have your own research, your own discoveries, your own connections to make, and so I I, I can't wait to to see you in that program. We also have Mythgard Academy with tons of free resources. This week is Myth Moot, which has been uh, bumped up online and includes a graduation ceremony, uh, in which um, Mickey gets to graduate uh, and has done so before. It, you actually wear the robe on the other side of the <laughs> stage for, for this one. As a teacher, I know you're part of that sort of thing. And and so there's still time to sign up and it's a great kind of integrated meeting um, that we have during this digital time. Um, okay, so now I'm going to say thank you to Dr. Sarah Brown for uh, her great work in, in this, and uh, thank you to everybody for the great questions and the congratulations that are kind of pouring in, Takako, Kate, Paul, Carl, Patricia, Jennifer, Sparrow, I'm going to stop reading them, and uh, and then congratulations to you, Mickey. You, I think you are done, right? Yeah, I, I appreciate your help on this, uh, Brian. As you know, it was, uh, it was a, a long process <laughs> and then COVID. yeah we didn't even talk about the fact that you're the director of a program that uh d you know d switched to emergency remote uh digital education in the midst yeah. of a global pandemic yeah. and somebody from new york in the relatively center of that during that period and still able to come up finish yeah. this yeah. yeah yeah so thank you you were a big part of helping me get, get it done so thank you wow. appreciate it. For me, uh, there was a great topic, so it was mostly um, just enjoyment of whatever you threw at me. So, Good. all right. Well, thanks, folks, and uh, please do share, and we'll see you on the other side. All right. Bye-bye.